recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff. This is Triviality. The cream of the crop. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil, and I won't be your host today, but we'll get to that in a minute. Here in the studio with uh, our core team here, uh, we got Ken, Matt, and Jeff. How's it going? Hey, what's up? Doing okay. Hey. Uh, so everyone... What was that, Jeff? Yeah, what was that? It's wacky Jeff He's today. just trying to inject a little energy into this <laughs> early morning podcast. Yeah, we didn't want to say anything about your shirt being off, but I'm sure it's, <laughs> you know, it, it'll be okay today. The lampshade back on the lamp. Well, we're coming from behind, Neil. We uh, we lost last time, so we're going to be the Washington Generals today, but I wanted to be no, as no, distracting no. as possible. So, so since we took the Black Panther, uh, you know mantle from you i think we're going to be killmonger and you're going to be just plain old t'challa yeah we're t'challa with no special sauce basically but anyways my shirt's off as a distraction technique so we'll see if it works uh yeah and the other thing about black panther uh which is a fun movie they have that plant everywhere in their land why didn't everyone just drink some of that in the one spot yeah they should all drink it though and then it could be a a super powerful nation where they don't need starbucks they are a privilege they are a super powerful nation i think they're doing all right without it (laughs) Yeah, they don't need it. I will say the only line I didn't like in Infinity War, uh, it's no spoilers, is when they're in Wakanda and uh, T'Challa's uh, head security guard was like, we need a Starbucks. Like, you probably have the best beans in the world. What do you need a Starbucks for? It, no disrespect, Matt. <laughs> you know, it's okay. None, yeah. none taken. Although, Matt, would you would work at a Wakanda Starbucks. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, but uh, so we're, we're here uh, for a very special episode. It's a little bittersweet. A little uh, somber. A little somber today. We'll tell you why. But uh, in the studio... Uh, joining us from out of town, which was great, is our uh, cruiserweight champion uh, Patreon supporter, Dave Nelson. How's it going? It's going great, fellas. Thanks for having me here. Of course. Uh, so you might remember Dave was on a previous episode where he hosted. We played very poorly. Uh, but it was still a lot of fun. <laughs> that could be many episodes. <laughs> that could be a lot of episodes. Uh, but Dave, uh, why don't you tell uh, us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you're going to be changing the podcast today? Well, I uh, have come into town uh, from New York uh, on a business trip, I'm here. I uh, work as a lawyer in New York for a uh, Japanese company. And I'm here for a few days providing some bankruptcy advice to my colleagues in our Chicago office. And while I'm here, uh, I thought I would come and visit and uh, not really ask any questions, but simply offer myself for uh, bankruptcy advice <laughs> for you guys, since I know you're on the cusp of uh, <laughs> some bad days. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're bankrupt guys. That's all we can say. Um, Dave's here. Uh, this podcast is not going to be triviality anymore. It's going to be uh, bankruptcyality. So here's a question, though. Does, does Dave's uh, area of expertise cover moral bankruptcy? Because I think that's where I fall. <laughs> that's up to him. I don't know. In- impecuniality. <laughs> uh, there's the words we're looking for. Uh, but no, yeah, we're, we're very happy to have Dave here um, talking about it. Pro- hopefully not talking about a subject we know nothing about uh, yet. But uh, that we was could last get there. time. Yeah, that was last time, right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, what kind of, you wrote a game for us today. Um, uh, any changes from last time? Is it harder? It's, uh, not harder. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, it's a little bit easier, I think, but, uh, still, I think, uh, yeah. and a few challenges. it to me like I'm a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like, yeah. You're... Like a four-year-old Doogie Howser. All right. So, uh, me and Matt, uh, holding the, the current championship, mm-hmm. we're going to be Killmonger and the gentlemen across from us are going to be T'Challa. Can we be T'Challa's sister? Because she's cool. What's her name? I forget her name. Then no, you can't. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we'll be T'Challa. Um, just plain. No, ba- no Black Panther. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Just T'Challa. We'll see what happens in the end. Mm. Uh, this is just T'Challa after he played baseball for the Dodgers and then and, had a uh, singing career. Me and Matt are going to be over here making some questionable political moves. Okay. Um, and we'll keep score for you, too. Keep it easy. Super. So, yeah. I mean, uh, let's... Uh, Throw it to the rules guy real quick, and uh, we'll get back to Dave. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. The cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Don't. Yeah. He is <laughs> outdone himself. He didn't sound like we were going bankrupt. He sounded happy. <laughs> yeah. Take uh, it away. I'm going to need him to do it one more time, but a little more somber. <laughs> <laughs> no? We only paid him once? Okay. Just, just fair once. enough. <laughs> Take it away. There you go. All right, guys. Round one, question one. Category is the Civil War. Mm. The bloodiest day in U.S. history 
is considered to be September 17th, 1862, the date of the Battle of Sharpsburg, Mm. as it was called by the Confederacy, after the Maryland town adjacent to the battlefield. More than 22,000 were killed or wounded that day, including future Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was shot through the neck. Mm. By what more famous name was the Battle of Sharpsburg called on the Union side? We're in. Mm. Do you know some of the battle names? Shiloh's coming to mind, but I, I don't know if that's the TV show about the dog or if that was a battle in the Civil War. Um, I believe it might be both. But... Okay, because I remember that was a bloody <laughs> battle, right, Shiloh? It was, yeah. Um, There's another name. You're not, it, I'm pretty, is it's not Gettysburg, right? I, I feel like the easy answer is Gettysburg. Because Gettysburg that... was a, like a two-day battle or something, right? Yeah. I, and, 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 Antietam? Antietam. Sounds... I always think of Antietam and Shiloh as being really bloody. And I feel like, Jeff, and this is a compliment to you, I feel like you're the type of guy who have, like, has like a huge-ass Civil War book <laughs> by the toilet that you read every time you take a dump. I don't. Uh, World War II is always my jam, so. Okay, well, that's not, fine. Not much of a Civil War guy, but I like Antietam. Antietam. I don't know how you feel about that. I'll go with Antietam. Good deal. So there's a couple uh, different ways that this breaks down and kind of gets confusing because there's like the bloodiest battle period, and then there's the bloodiest day of fighting. And I think um, the bloodiest day was part of the Battle of Antietam. Well, we're off to a good start, gents. Right. That's uh, Battle of Antietam. I think Gettysburg was the, the, the worst overall. Battle, but it was several days. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was three days long, mm-hmm. Gettysburg. And you guys can catch uh, Paul Rudd coming out in Antietam and the Wasp. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number two. Category is TV on the radio, or should I say radio on the TV? Mm. In a very special episode of season two of WKRP in Cincinnati, station staff had to deal with the fallout from a station-promoted concert at which fans pushing their way into the show crushed several people to death. The episode was based on a real-life disaster that occurred at the Riverfront Coliseum in Cincinnati in December 1979, just a few weeks prior to the show's taping. Who was the band that headlined this tragic concert, which was part of their first North American tour with their new drummer? For five bonus points, tell me who their original drummer was. Oh, so Ken okay. and I are both drummers. Was it you guys? It was us. Oh. I died. And Ken replaced me. A decade before you were both born, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do know a band that lost a drummer, and I don't know. I can think of a few in that era that yeah. lost a drummer. And I'm trying to think, and and I, I like his clue about uh, North American, uh, so it makes me think we're we're thinking of the Brits. Sure. We're gonna lock in on this one. Okay, so uh, we're Jeff. So first, Jeff and I wrote down uh, the Who and Led Zeppelin because we were initially thinking that it was a, a foreign band. Uh, Keith Moon died. Yeah, we were on this. Yeah, we were on this. Like somebody died. Kick. Yeah, and John Bonham died. But um, uh, I think Bonham died in the eighties. Right. And Jeff wrote down a great band, uh, which is interesting because the drummer went solo. Uh, which we put. Gen- we have Genesis, and we also have the Eagles. Don Henley and Don Henley, I believe, went solo for a while too. So I do like Jeff's. Was he the? Uh, he was the drummer of the Eagles. Drummer and singer. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, that's another good guess time frame wise. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that we're missing. I mean, um, Beatles, what were they doing in that era? I mean, Ringo's. I, I, they never really changed. No, drummers, yeah, that right? wouldn't matter. No. Um, and like I said, uh, was there the a Stones change with had, the Stones? No, they always yeah. had the same drummer. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like your answer, Genesis. I kind of feel like it's the right time frame. Yeah, because and it, I know we were stuck on somebody dying, but I don't think that's necessarily correct. So yeah, we're gonna lock in with Genesis. Okay. So uh, me and Matt initially were thinking about Great White, um, but I think that was a pyrotechnics incident. Yeah, there was a fire, and then like the the emergency escapes when it opened, and a bunch of people died. I believe. Right. So this so, is not the scenario. So ultimately, we're gonna go with uh, Rolling Stones, who I believe had a a sort of stampeding incident at one of their uh, concerts, and I think that might have been the same one with the. Uh, the heavy security incident. They did. I feel like that one was in California. Though. It was I Hells Angels, remember. right? Well, let's find out. There there was a dead drummer involved. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The drummer of the band uh, died, I think, uh, in late 1978. Uh, his name was Keith Moon, and the band was The Who. It was The Who. That was okay. the first thing I wrote down, too. Because that was at one concert. Uh, he didn't die then, but when he passed out, and then a dude from the audience came in, played the rest of the show, and then he tragically died not too long after that. Yeah, I couldn't remember the year for that. I knew Bonham died later, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's that you can watch that on YouTube. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, question number three. The category is fictional prep schools. Which adolescent anti-hero, whose exploits are read by 10th and 11th graders across America, 
gets himself expelled from Pensy Preparatory Academy before eventually ending up in a mental hospital in Southern California. Uh, it, that's up to you. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I read whatever this is. Mm -hmm. So that, the name is familiar to me, but I don't know uh, the context of it. Okay. It sounds right. So we can lock in with it. Okay. We're locked. Isn't there that one book with the, those two boys that like had a rivalry at a prep school? Like one nearly kills or kills the other? I don't know. I, it, so, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I, I just I have no no lock on anything. Oh, we're writing the book, not the character. Oh, is it the book or the character? The character. The character. Oh, my bad. Okay. Well, then, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> that makes it harder. <laughs> makes it a little harder. So, um, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you can give me the character or the title of the book. Okay. Ooh. All right, we're locked in. And? We're going to go with Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love his books. Um, I, the only thing I could think of, 10th and 11th adolescent who gets in trouble, I'm thinking Catcher in the Rye, so I put Holden Caulfield. And the answer is the central character in J.D. Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye, wow. Holden Caulfield. Oh, Matt. It's time to put on my human hunting 100 100% 100 Matt. If I guess Catcher in the Rye for every literature question, it will be right eventually. <laughs> and it was today. You know, I've never read that book, so that's why I had no Nor idea. Nor have I. I thought he was in the wilderness, the book. In the no. Book. no? We t <laughs> that's Hatchet. It's Oh, I love that. <laughs> Hatchet is one of my favorite books. Gary, Gary Paulson. I met Gary Paulson. My picture's in our Kamark library. Oh, really? A Polaroid, yeah. <laughs> All right, question four. Category is the Donald Trump Film Festival. So on my first appearance, uh, as you may remember, there was some discussion as to whether <laughs> Donald Trump's official favorite movie was Citizen Kane or Bloodsport. <laughs> um, Very similar. N y yeah, you laugh, but uh, I understand that confusion, uh, given that the two films are virtually indistinguishable. <laughs> uh, Bloodsport, of course, starred Jean-Claude Van Damme, but the muscles from Brussels actually got his first Hollywood job mm. as an extra on what 1984 dance-themed movie, a sequel to which amazingly was also released in 1984, and carried the subtitle Electric Boogaloo. Neil's in. Oh, yeah. We're locked in. <laughs> yep. This is uh, break in. We're yeah. locked in with break in. It is break in. The answer is break in. Yeah, so that poster behind that's a Canon film, same studio, Runaway Train. Mm. Yeah, so if you haven't seen the documentary uh, Electric Boogaloo, the untold story of Canon films, it's great. Yeah, it's very interesting. What's the subtitle of Runaway Train 2? Uh, it, sh it should have, but yeah. Runaway Train. Also Electric Boogaloo. Also Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I looked up that uh, where that Bloodsport Donald Trump thing comes from, and there's a New Yorker article from 1997 where the uh, reporter is following Trump around, and they get on his gilded jet to right. fly from New York down to Mar-a-Lago, and uh, Trump immediately puts on Bloodsport on the VHS <laughs> on the plane, and very quickly, he talks about how much he loves the film, very quickly gets bored, and has his son, Eric... Uh, basically fast forward from fight to fight to fight. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> He's uh, not so much on the uh, plot development. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I, I know I got it from somewhere. Yeah, I'm I couldn't sure remember. a guy who doesn't have the, uh, the attention span for blood sport is a big fan of Citizen Kane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, category five. All right, question five, sorry. The category is music and journalism. A ridiculously named band called Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show had a top 10 hit in 1972 with the goofy tune, The Cover of a Rolling Stone. This is a two-part question, five points each. First, which Chicago-born Playboy magazine cartoonist and author of children's books such as The Giving Tree and A Light in the Attic wrote the song? Second, which musician's photograph graced the very first cover of Rolling Stone magazine, dated November 9, 1967? The photo showed him not on stage or in the studio, but wearing his trademark spectacles and in costume for his role in the Richard Lester-directed film, How I Won the War. Ken and I were having a, a nice laugh about The Giving Tree. And you guys, you guys made a face about uh, Dr. Hook. I used to listen to Dr. Hook when I was a kid. Really? Yeah, I cannot remember for the life of me one song, but I listened to a whole Dr. Hook cassette tape. My dad listened to it. Huh. On KTEL, I imagine. I have no idea. I can't remember one song. Yeah, it was last week I was in Oregon for work in like the middle of nowhere. And there was a bar fight in the hotel bar. Oh, no. And the sheriff was called. And mm. I swear to God, I thought it was for a second the eye patch guy from Dr. Hook. You know, the, 
<laughs> the guy with the long mustache and the uh, sort of, I don't know what you call that, kind of crushed cowboy hat. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, we so are in on it. both accounts. Yeah. Wait, so the sheriff had an eye patch? No. Oh, he didn't. that would have been really cool. He didn't. I just saw him from the side. I saw him from the one <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> like the Jack of Diamonds. Right? Uh, so you said Shel Silverstein wrote Giving Tree? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. All right, so we're looking at the guy, the first person on the cover of Rolling Stone with a trademark spectacles. Think of the spectacle clue. When I think of spectacles, I always think of Elton John, but I think he was much later. I was thinking of Elton John, too. Um, Can you just name any other artists that have glasses that would have been on Rolling Stone? I could I could see a, a famous Beatle. John Lennon. I could see John Lennon. I don't know. I know Shel Silverstein's correct. Um, okay, so we'll go Shel Silverstein... And we'll go. I could see. I could see John Lennon. All right, and we'll go John Lennon. Hmm. I don't know about those answers. We went with Shel Silverstein and John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> the answers are Shel Silverstein and, after a very long walk, John Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It helps to know that Richard Lester also directed uh, Help and uh, That's Hard Right Day's Night. That's I'm right. just texting my dad right now to find out what uh, Doctor Hook I should know. <laughs> We nearly walked past where oh, the sidewalk ends on that one. It's, it's all about freaking at the Freaker's Ball. Also written by Shel Silverstein. <laughs> all right. Oh, uh, after five, really quick. Uh, team T'Challa with 30 points and Team Killmonger with 40 points. See, we're in the portion in the middle of the movie right now. <laughs> yeah. We've just thrown you off the waterfall. <laughs> Spoilers. <right>. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, question six, guys. The category is speaking of Richard Lester. Mm. <laughs> Which Emmy winning and five time Grammy winning comedian, born in Peoria, Illinois in 1940, starred in a 1983 superhero film directed by Lester, and had a daughter who went on to appear regularly in the late 1980s ABC sitcom Head of the Class? I feel like I know Head of the Class from jokes about head of the class and not having ever seen head of the class yeah this is i'm trying to think of the superhero film from 83 it's probably your best lead in there are much less superhero movies in 1983 yeah yeah i mean really we're talking about the superman franchise which mm, is it like number three oh 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 uh they weren't uh quite scraping the uh the Doctor Strange's and the Ant Man's off the bottom of the barrel yet. How so, dare you? Um, I liked both of those. I did too. All three of I'm them. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying they're less popular initially. Now they're popular. Is this Had you heard of Ant Man prior to like 2009? No one even cared about Iron Man before Iron Man came out. Is this possible? It's true. Are you, are you locked in? They were locked in. Yeah. We're saying Richard Pryor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we also want Richard Pryor. Well, the movie was Superman 3. And the daughter was Rain Pryor, so the answer to the yeah. question is Richard Pryor. When he said Superman, I remember that Richard Pryor is randomly in a Superman movie. Yeah, I didn't mean to talk that out loud, but that's fine. On, I'd man. rather help each other out. Come on. He is. Uh, We're not on the same team. Yeah, thanks. He, he's there to provide the comic relief. <laughs> the, I think the script provided enough of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, question seven. The category is world leaders. Miguel Diaz-Canel was recently elected or should I say selected, as the new president of which nation, birthplace of flamethrowing Yankees relief pitcher Aroldis Chapman, and three-time Olympic heavyweight boxing champion Teofilo Stevenson? Okay, I don't know much about I just remember when he was on the Cubs, so it's either Cuba or Dominican Republic, because that's where most baseball players come from, I feel like, from that edge of the world. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that there's still a Castro in power in Cuba. Right As of right now? Yeah, Raul. Okay. Yeah. Or he said selected, though, not elected. That was his clue. Ooh. So could Castro be in power, but then they selected a different person? Mayhaps. I could see that. Okay. So uh, Cuba. I feel like I would have heard that, but you know, I don't keep up on the news too much anymore. So. All right. We'll go Cuba. Yeah. Um. So you guys locked in with Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when Chapman was coming over, there was a lot of dispute about his age because he was from. I believe Cuba, and they have a tendency to fudge uh, ages a bit, um, but we went with Cuba. Uh, that's right. It's a country that doesn't really do elections too heavy, uh, the island nation of Cuba. All right. Oof. Yeah, he he looked like 28, and I mean, he looks he lo- he's looked 40 since he was 25, but they <laughs> said he was like 19 when he came over, and like, okay. <laughs> sure. the, the sun beats pretty hot <laughs> yeah. in Cuba. Does does a number on your mm-hmm. complexion. 
All right, question number eight, category is geography. Which nation in the Pacific Ocean, comprised of over 1,100 individual islands, gained its independence from the United States in 1979? It's home to the world's largest shark sanctuary. It was the site of almost 70 U.S. nuclear tests in the 1940s and 50s, and was named after an 18th century English explorer. This feels like one you would know for sure. What was the year they gained independence? 1979. So we did a lot of... You guys are locked in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of nuclear testing um, around the atolls. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bikini Atoll, Palmyra Atoll. This is all you. I, I know I know the question. I'm, I I'm, When I hear it, I'll know it because I've seen a video about it. I just I can't pull the, the name. Oh, tell me about the video. It was just talking exactly what he said. It was just oh. that they gained independence and that there was nuclear tests there and... They didn't say the name either? That's really weird for a video. Yeah, I kept saying redacted. <laughs> <laughs> they blew a lot of them up underwater in the South Pacific, though. That's how we got Godzilla. Exactly. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Looks like a dog. I think Cook might be the uh, the closest I'm going to get. It matches okay. all the criteria, so we'll That's say the fine. Cook Islands. And we're going to go with the Philippines. Well, Cook Islands is a nation in the South Pacific. I think it used to be part of New Zealand, but what I'm going for is the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep, that makes it. sense. Marshall. Yep. You were right there with all those atolls. Yeah. <laughs> I should uh, I should remember My that. My South Pacific geography is not amazing. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't quite get the uh, island nation for whom the question atolled. Couldn't, <laughs> couldn't quite get there. All right, question nine. The category is cuisine of the subcontinent. Mm hmm Vindaloo, which originated in the Goa region of Western India, is used to describe a spicy meat curry dish. The term is believed to derive from what language, which boasts the sixth highest number of native speakers in the world? Uh, yeah, so they're in... Um... As far as number of native speakers, it's Mandarin Chinese. Mm -hmm. I think the second most prevalently spoken is English. Mm-hmm. Um, French or no, 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 not French. Or or maybe cause how how spoken is Hindi? It's got to be up there. As I would think it'd be up there. Hindi, Urdu, you put. I put Urdu, thinking that it wouldn't be the most popular one in India, but the second most popular in India. Tagalog's probably not. Um, Spanish is up on that list. Yeah, yeah, Tagalog is not Vind that high. Vindaloo sounds middle. I would think either Hindi or Urdu or. Yeah, I, I, northwest into the Pakistani area. I'm thinking Urdu. So okay, all right, we're we're gonna uh, do what Jeff does and. <laughs> Go with Urdu. Yeah. We also went with Urdu. Wow. Well, the term actually comes from the name carne jivinha dalios, which is a Spanish. dish of meat, wine, and garlic brought by colonists who came to Goa in the early 16th century from Portugal. Oh. The answer is Portuguese. Oh, Por say, Portuguese. Oh, I was so close. I was thinking about Portuguese. I was like, because Brazil is 200 plus million people. but Yeah, nobody really... Uh, thinks about how many Portuguese speakers there are, but there's like a lot, you know, four, <laughs> four times as many as French speakers. Or something I mean, they like don't that. all speak Spanish. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of Spanish with a draw. <laughs> all right. Question 10. The category is hockey. So the classic, Yay. <laughs> the classic 1977 movie slap shot about a struggling minor league hockey team features a scene in which the three somewhat imbalanced Hanson brothers jump into the crowd to pummel a fan. Two years later, life, as it sometimes will, imitated <laughs> art, when players from the visiting Boston Bruins left the ice at the end of a 4-3 win to enter the stands and fight fans at Madison Square Garden. The climax of the clash had which Bruins defenseman and current NBC hockey commentator several rows up in the crowd, famously beating Rangers fan John Captain with his own shoe. <laughs> NBC commentator. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, Jeff. This is all you. I don't watch hockey, so. <clears throat> oh man. Um, I thought he was going to ask what the name of the team was from Slapshot. And that, that... Chiefs. Chiefs. <laughs> I'm a Caps fan, so I watched a lot of playoff hockey oh, this what's year. What's that guy's name? I got way too much of this guy. They're so awesome. I'm thinking about like the Chicago commentators, but I know when they throw it back to the yeah. Back you to the you know it's not Brent Supple, so you're good there. No, Eddie O. Is a... Eddie Olchek was Chicago too. And you yeah. said 70s, 79? Uh, yeah, this took place, uh, I think it was 79, yeah. I know the guy, I can picture him. Let me just... Not Ronick. Because... Jeremy Ronick. <laughs> he's, he's, the one, he's the one that everybody hates. Is it Doc Emmerich? <laughs> Barry Melrose? 
<laughs> I think we've uh, gone through like everybody who's not the I guy. Don't, I don't think Barry Melrose is playing in 1979. <laughs> Does not look like a hockey player anymore. Well, Looks like, like a commentator. The only uh, Bruin from a, even close to that era I could think of is Bobby Orr. So you wanted to go Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr. Oh, man. I'm in a similar position to Ken here. Uh, so jokingly, do you want to say uh, Doc Emmerich? Sounds good with me. Good deal. And we are locking in with... Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were writing a real thing. Life imitating art imitating life. Uh, the answer is Mike Milbury. Yeah, that's. Let me let me look him up to make the sure. Only, it's the the guy only other I one I, that we didn't mention was Keith Jones, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Mike Milbury and Keith Jones are the only other two we did. Who is Doc Emmerich? <laughs> so um, Doc Emmerich is one of like the famous announcers. He does most of the playoff yeah. coverages. Yeah. He's exactly really good. I was thinking of. And yeah. he um, looks like the kind of guy who'd hit somebody over the head with a. He's shoe. well known for having like an exceptional vocabulary. He, they once tracked how many different. Adjectives, stuff he used to describe puck motion during a game it was amazing. It was like 127 different ones in one game. Yeah, he's great. Uh, but they call him Doc because he has like a degree in uh, hockey. hockey. No, a degree, it's... a degree in beating people with a shoe. <laughs> yeah. um, a degree in synonyms. So no, in, in like speech or shoe literature allergy. or something like that. Uh, after round one, it looks like uh, Team T'Challa has 50 points, so betting about 50 percent, and Team Killmonger has 60 points going into the swing round. That's about right for the movie. Doing, nah, doing a little bit better than last time. Guys. Oh yeah, no, this is this. I mean, your questions are so good. They were last time. It's just we were dumb. So yeah. <laughs> we've been right. training. So swing round is about bankruptcy. <laughs> yes. Law. Uh, the swing round is going to be television trios. Okay. So I'm going to name uh, uh, ten different sets of three characters, and you just need to give me the TV show that the characters mm-hmm. come from. So. If I said Laverne DeFazio, Shirley Feeney, and Carmine Ragusa, your answer would be... Laverne Boy, and Shirley. Boy Meets World. I'm sorry. <laughs> Laverne and Shirley. Super. All right. You guys are Ken experts. Burns, The Civil War. <laughs> Number one, Frederick Stubbs, Dwayne Nelson, and D. Thomas. Number two, Jimmy McNulty, Omar Little, and Russell Bell. Number three, Diane Chambers, Woody Boyd, and Norm Peterson. Number four, Brandon Walsh, Brenda Walsh, and Kelly Taylor. Uh, number five, Phil Dunphy, Jay Pritchett, and Cameron Tucker. Number six, Natalie Green, Tootie Ramsey, and Joe Polnicek. Number seven, Oscar Martinez, Ryan Howard, and Kevin Malone. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's real bad. Number eight, David Brent. Tim Canterbury and Don Tinsley. This <laughs> guy. <laughs> Number nine, Andy Taylor, Floyd Lawson, and Otis Campbell. And number ten, Chris Traeger, Ben Wyatt, and April Ludgate. Dave, um, Dave Nelson. Okay. <laughs> well done. All right. All the answers of the swing round are locked in, so we're going to throw it to Dave to uh, go through the questions again. All right, so the first one was Frederick Stubbs, Dwayne Nelson, and D. Thomas. All right, so Team T'Challa, we really weren't sure on this one. We we're trying to think of the show where the main character says, like, I'm going to have a heart attack or this one's going to kill me, and we couldn't remember the name of it if it's Good Times or not, but we went with Good Times. Yeah, that show is Good Times. Uh, I got stuck on Dwayne Nelson. I thought it was Dwayne uh, from A Different World, so I said A Different World. Yeah, that was Dwayne Wayne. Yeah. Uh, Frederick Stubbs was a little bit better known as Rerun. No. This is what's happening. Oh, okay. We were in that right... We were, we were was, circling that one. I think it was the only 70s sitcom with an African-American cast. That, that we, we did not name, name yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question two was Jimmy McNulty, Omar Little, and Russell Bell. Mm-hmm. Omar's coming. This is The Wire. Yeah, we said The Wire. And it is The Wire. Number three, Diane Chambers, Woody Boyd, and Norm Peterson. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are three guys who have never been in my kitchen? Uh, <laughs> we said cheers. We also said cheers. You're both correct. It is cheers. Number four, Brandon Walsh, Brenda Walsh, and Kelly Taylor. This one we had so much trouble on. Oh. We said either Melrose Place or 90210. Jeff had an app with a coin, and we flipped it, and it was Melrose Place. Yeah, and I think it's not either of those two. I think that they were brother and sister, um, and they were two of the party of five. But uh, it was Beverly Hills 90210. We lost the coin flip. (laughs) (laughs) All right, number five, Phil Dunphy, Jay Pritchett, and Cameron Tucker. I mean, we had no idea, so we said uh, all in the family. 
Yes. Uh, you're not wrong with family, but this is more of a modern family. Yep. Mm, never watched it. That's why you got it wrong. It's modern family. <laughs> Phil Dunphy. That's, That's yeah. the name we know. Yeah, if you haven't seen the show, just watch the episode where they go to Vegas. So Phil Dunphy is um, that guy, right? Ty Burrell. Ty Burrell. Ty Burrell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Number six, Natalie Green, Tootie Ramsey, and Joe Polnicek. Do you guys know it? Of course. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we said the facts of life. We agree, the facts of life. That's right. This question was all about the facts of life. <laughs> They're all about you. My only connection to that was that uh, Amy Schumer sketch with the 12 Angry Men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the tilt on the table. All uh, right. Question seven. Oscar Martinez, Ryan Howard, and Kevin Malone. The Office, U.S. Uh, we said, uh, to quote the British, the office, an American workplace. <laughs> uh, you're both right. One, uh, perhaps a little more uh, mm-hmm. pretentiously than the other. But it is the <laughs> office. Question eight. David Brent, Tim Canterbury, and Don Tinsley. Uh, that would be the office, UK. We agree. The office, UK. That, that's correct. A British workplace. <laughs> no, it's, well, the in the UK, to distinguish it from the original, they called it ours the office and american workplace so. yeah okay whatever they did they still really? do. i had no idea why they touched that subtitle too <laughs> <laughs> they joke about it in that episode where they do the release yeah yeah all right question number nine andy taylor floyd lawson and otis campbell uh i i think that's the andy griffith show yeah it came to me at the end when i was thinking of otis uh i believe that's andy griffith show yeah that's right otis was always drunk in the mm-hmm. cell um barely keeping his hat on that's the andy griffith show and number 10 chris traeger ben wyatt and april ludgate uh parks and recreation literally the right answer parks and rec <laughs> very good guys parks and recreation can't so, yeah. believe i lost 90210 on the coin flip all right well after the swing round it looks like team t'challa picked up 40 points to put their total at uh, 90 points and uh, team Killmonger picked up 35 points to put them in the lead right now with 95 so at this juncture uh, you find out Ch- T'Challa is not dead yeah right there may be hope there might be hope you're correct all right guys round two question one the category is tri bond which bearded actor widely known for his work in television commercials also made guest appearances on the original Baywatch series and on King of the Hill and turned up in Sam Raimi's 2002 film version of Spider-Man. Uh, I think we're okay. So you okay. said Chuck Mangione, but mm-hmm. you really mean Joe Manganiello? It's possible. <laughs> Chuck Mangione was uh, a Joe Manganiello played... No, he was a, a musician. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Manganiello played uh, Flash in uh, Spider-Man 1. Okay. And Chuck Mangione uh, played the flugelhorn. He does have a, he does have a beard now. Yeah, um, that's is he in... TV commercials a lot? I have no idea. I just said that because he was on King of the Hill. And he was the only like, guest person I could think of. Who, that, Joe like... Manganiello or no, Chuck Mangione? Chuck Mangione was only... We're going to go with Joe Manganiello. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so this person, I, I had no idea about King of the Hill. I didn't watch King of the Hill. He was in many, many commercials. He was on an episode, uh, uh, excuse me, he was in Spider-Man, the first Raimi one. And on Baywatch, he got into an argument with Hulk Hogan on the mm. beach. And I believe it's Randy Savage. That is your answer, <laughs> the Macho Man himself, Randy Savage. I knew he was in Baywatch. There's a really, there's like three episodes of Baywatch where wrestlers come on and do yeah, wrestler things. I, I definitely saw a, like an image the other day of of Hogan on Baywatch. Yeah. I kind of remember that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, question two. The category is literary arithmetic. So this question will ask a math problem using the names of several authors. For each author's name, I want you to substitute the number contained in the title of a famous novel by that author. So, for example, if I asked, what's George Orwell plus Ray Bradbury? I'd be asking, what is 1984 plus 451? And the answer would be 2,435. Got it? Okay. So, what's Charles Dickens plus Ken Kesey plus Kurt Vonnegut? You're locked in? Yeah. Okay. So, um... We have Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah, I'm pretty sure um, Ken Kesey is uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Okay, so one plus five, so six. Which, which Dickens novel has a number in it? There's the A Christmas Carol. Yeah. Uh, David Copperfield, Oliver yeah. Twist. A Tale of Two Cities. Oh, Tale of Two Cities. Okay. So two plus one plus was that five. Him? That was him, right? Yeah. Okay. So eight. Is that right? <laughs> I think so. That's the hard part. Ooh, I might have botched this. All right, oh, we're no. locked in with eight. Yeah, I think Ken Kesey did do One Flew at the Cuckoo's Nest, but I wrote for that one, Catch-22. 
which would have been Joseph Heller. So yeah. we said 29. <laughs> well, one of you got it right. It, uh, <laughs> it was two for Tale of Two Cities That's plus one for One That's Flew right. Over the Cuckoo's Nest plus five for Slaughterhouse Five for yeah. a grand total of eight. I jumped the gun. I, Great question. That'd, I, be a, that'd be a fun game, like a, a, like a little mini game. I think that's the game. I, I think he has too, yeah, many I don't more know game, we, and too many more books and we're in trouble there. Yeah, I was going to put Gabriel Garcia Marquez in there, but ah. I, I want to bung up the words. You don't want 27 Carlos Aureliano Buendias in that? Mm. Yeah. Could have Roberto Bologna. A hundred years of silence. I'm going to write a whole bonus game on that, but it'd be movies, books, and other things, TV shows. That'd be fun. That's a good one. All right, category uh, is question three. The category is law enforcement. On September 17th, 2007, Massachusetts Senator John Kerry was wrapping up an appearance at the University of Florida when the Q&A session was hijacked by one. student Andrew Meyer who began a rambling diatribe about Carey's membership in the Skull and Bones Society while an undergraduate at Yale. Campus police cut Meyer short and began escorting him out of the auditorium, which he resisted. As the matter escalated, Meyer made what famous impassioned plea, which the cops declined to honor. <laughs> <laughs> we're, are we, we're in are we all thinking this is uh, Don't Taze Me, don't Bro? Don't Taze Me, Bro. The don't Taze Me, Bro. Yeah, this was the bro who, uh, who was, was very much tased. <laughs> he was again against and again. tasing. He was anti-tasing is the problem. Yeah, you're both correct. Excellent. Question four. The category is municipal mottos. As I'm sure you know, folks, the official motto of Chicago is herbs in horto, which is Latin for city in a garden. Sure, I knew that. I did not know that. <laughs> of course. How, how could you not? Yeah. Well, now you vote do. early and vote often. I thought that was our <laughs> motto. I, I come to town to educate uh, folks about bankruptcy law and municipal mottos. <laughs> Most and, people who ask us Chicago questions end up teaching us something. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, this isn't actually a Chicago question because what I want to know is which fictional TV town has the motto "A noble spirit embiggens the smallest ah, man." Okay, I am good with this. We're good. This might be the words of a Jebediah Springfield. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, then I have no idea. I mean, wow. I know who that is. I know it's Simpsons now that you're saying that, but... <laughs> you don't know the town? No. It's Shelbyville, right? Is that what it is? <laughs> We're going with Springfield. We're locked in. We said Springfield from The Simpsons. That's right. It is on the statue of Jebediah Springfield uh, from The Simpsons. It is Springfield. It's always a Simpsons question. Don't forget that. <laughs> and a Macho Man question. That we missed. <laughs> Which we got wrong. <laughs> I don't know how you missed that. We are we are not the Almost, cream. I guess I guess Joe Manganiello. Well, I figured uh, maybe he'd wasn't be, a, ready. be a kid. On, <laughs> I honestly watch. never knew quite how strong I was until you said Chuck Mangione, and I was able to not laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Question five. The category is paleontology. Researchers at University College Cork in the Republic of Ireland recently made a groundbreaking discovery while examining fossils from Bapiosaurus a creature of the early Cretaceous, that at well over two meters high stood head and shoulders above almost all other feathered dinosaurs. Specifically, the scientists concluded that Bapiosaurus suffered from what annoying skin condition, which is currently estimated to affect about half of all adult humans. We're, we're locked in. So we're talking about what? Rosacea? Eczema? eczema. Freckles? There's a couple other... Um... Eczema sometimes can get pretty bad psoriasis i feel like doesn't affect half i mean that's does, a... does acne affect half the yeah i mean maybe you guys i feel like everyone gets acne jokingly i said freckles but well yeah i don't know so eczema acne freckles rosacea this dinosaur sounds very self-conscious about its appearance it's science i'll, I'll defer to you <laughs> <laughs> i don't know you pick i don't know you pick i don't know you pick let me hear the question one more time oh, no, 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 no 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 pick, pick a fucking skin condition let's go <laughs> I'm going to sit here all day now just to torture you. Uh, some people have to go to work. Yeah, that's fair. I'll be nice to Matt. You just want to go acne? Yeah, that's fine. All right, we're at locked in with acne. As much as I wanted to say uh, psoriasaurus, uh, we're going to go with eczema. Well, there was a clue in the question uh, when I talked about Bapiosaurus standing head and shoulders. Mm -hmm. Not dandruff. dandruff. All other feathered dinosaurs, you're right. It was dandruff. Oh. So after... Five questions in the second round. It looks like Team T'Challa gained uh, 40 points there. So we're going to be at 130. And Team Killmonger gained uh, 20 points. And they're going to be mm -hmm. at 115. Looks like we're uh, fighting on the, the weird railroad tracks right now. Yeah, with the magnets. <laughs> Question six. The category is literature. Which 1972 autobiographical novel 
bathed in mescaline monologues and motorcycles, and later adapted for the screen by a director who began his career as a cartoonist and animator, was subtitled A Savage Journey into the Heart of the American Dream. Marin, mm. is mescaline, is that some sort of drug? Yeah, I feel like that's a fear and loathing thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that is a fear and loathing, right? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's probably the movie then, right? Yeah, but who's the, who's the author of that? It's, Hunter S. Uh, Thompson? Sounds about right to me. We're going to go Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. After all that. Yeah, not uh, not one hour ago I said, oh, Terry Gilliam directed Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? And you said, yeah. The answer is Fear and Loathing in Las Anyone Vegas. Anyone I think of mescaline, right? <laughs> well, no, the motorcycle threw me off because I just, I pictured Johnny Depp. I knew Terry Gilliam did not direct He did not Rum do the Rum Diaries, Diaries no. The, the, the book, and I guess the movie too, begins with him going to Las Vegas to cover a motorcycle race. Oh, that's right. Sports oh, you know Illustrated what? Or something like that. I did not listen to the part where he said cartoonist and animator because Terry Gilliam was an animator. Yeah, that yeah. was my bad. One Sorry. hour ago. How did you not yeah. hear that? <laughs> we we're looking at Terry Gilliam's filmography. Yes. Sorry. Question seven. The category is the Olympics. FIFA recently held the final match of the 21st World Cup at the Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow. In 1980, under the much clunkier name, the Grand Arena of the Central Lenin Stadium, the same building played host to the games of the 22nd Olympiad, which were boycotted by 66 nations, including the United States, Japan, and West Germany. Those countries all refused to participate in protest of the Soviet Union having recently done what? For five bonus points, tell me who finished in third place at this summer's World Cup. Yeah, I just believe I know the third place winner, so. Okay, so um, you're locked in? Yeah. Good. So we think it's Belgium? Yeah, because uh, it was France and uh, whoever, I'm not thinking about it right now, uh, in the final, but then it was England and Belgium for third place. Mm. And, and Belgium... England uh, does I, like shooting themselves in the foot in the World Cup, yeah. so. As far as events in the 1980s, we had That's the right. we had the Iranian hostage crisis, and I think about 80 was the end of Carter's term. Uh-huh. Um, did Russia invade Afghanistan? I am so out of my element, Let's say they, uh, uh, I feel like there was some stuff in the Middle East, so we'll say they invaded Afghanistan. And Okay, so invaded Afghanistan and Belgium. Uh, we are going with, uh, they took military action in Ukraine and Russia. Well, in December 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Mm. So that's the first part. And then the bonus, uh, the third place game was England versus Belgium. Mm-hmm. And uh, England, as they want to do, failed miserably. Uh, and third place medal went to Belgium. I'm very, trouble. I'm very proud of us there. Killmonger is looking pretty beat up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question eight. The category is lies and the lying liars who tell them. In the mid to late 2000s, B turtlenecked entrepreneur Elizabeth Holmes became the darling of Silicon Valley after dropping out of Stanford at age 19 to start what was seemingly the next big thing in biotech. However, earlier this year, Holmes had to admit to the Securities and Exchange Commission that she had instead participated in a massive fraud. Specifically, Holmes fessed up to overstating revenues by a factor of 100 (laughs) and hiding the fact that the company's products never actually, you know, worked. What's the name of the company founded by Holmes? It's a portmanteau of two words whose ancient Greek origins mean healing and to distinguish. I mean, if you want to talk about uh, health products that don't work, we don't need to go to Gwyneth Paltrow, right? No. Can you think of word for healing that would be like at a spa or something? I'm just trying to think of Greek words that... It's, I'm guessing it's like stones or... No, it's not. Cream of some sort? No, no, no. I it's the Greek word for healing, whatever that happens to be. I, I'm, I'm actually thinking of what her product was, though. No. It's not Spanx. That's the other girl. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like big products. Not Spanx. Trying to yeah, I'm just trying to think of a product that yeah. was kind of exposed as not working recently. And yeah, and you said it was the darling of Silicon Valley, right? So. She was, yeah. Oh, interesting. So I was thinking of biotech, and I wrote down. I know it's not right, but we wrote down like Fitbit and stuff like that. That like we either track your weight, your steps, or like heart monitoring, or um, like a weight loss thing. Can you think of any product like that? Like not Botox, but. It's got to be something like that, right? Like it's bi- biology Most and technology. Most weight loss pills actually work, though, because they're like crack, amphetamines, you know? basically. Yeah. 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 I was think so. I started thinking it was those um, stupid magnetic braces. Oh, I, I had that, I had thought about that too. <laughs> that they say like balances your chi through the power of magnet. Yeah. We have 
finish this question. <laughs> we believe that there is also a fork in us. So mm -hmm. yeah. So we're we're just gonna we're gonna go with uh, ancestry. Oh, ancestry. For no reason. We're gonna go with uh, vajazzling. <laughs> That's the one we were thinking of. Well, in ancient Greek, uh, healing, the word for healing is therapia, mm -hmm. and the word for to distinguish is diagnosis. So the name that uh, super creepy pre-convict Elizabeth Holmes came up with was Theranos. Oh, I've never heard that. Sounds <laughs> evil. So what, was the, what did the product do? Sounds like Thanos. It was supposed to take one drop of your blood from a tiny little pinprick and run like 12 zillion tests for, okay. you know, the cost of 13 and a half cents or something oh, like, like the that. future. Shockingly, it was a little more complicated than that. <laughs> Weird. All right, question nine. The category is Southeast Asia. All right, Jeff's got this one. Borneo is the third largest non-continent island in the world, behind Greenland and New Guinea, and is also notable for being occupied by three different nations, Malaysia, Indonesia, and what much smaller country that has a population of just under 500,000 and has never had a democratically elected leader? Yeah. Its very much non-democratically elected leader used to be considered the richest man in the world, but that was before Clippy the paperclip vaulted Bill Gates ahead of him. Hmm. I have no idea, so it's on you. Because I know this. It's not, um, it's not Macau, right? No. Macau is a constituent of China. Okay. It's, uh... oh, got it. I'm thinking of that. Uh, oh, reluctant. yes, that's correct. That's fine. I don't know. I don't think that's right. I need a high five. That, that, that took me way too long. <laughs> because Elton Hold John on. used they to can, We can talk about him. it. So yeah. you, said, you said, what did you say, Vatican? Yeah. But like, the Pope's not very rich, right? Mm, not this Pope. Mm, they're pretty rich. Popes are rich? <laughs> Have you seen that hat? A lot of money in that church. <laughs> yeah, like, am I in the wrong line of work? <laughs> I, yes. uh, I don't know. I was just thinking maybe it was something a little tricky. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely less than 500,000, but that's not in the southeast of Asia, right? No, but maybe they have a little Maybe stake they, in the yeah, island or something have a little something on the side <laughs> pass it around the collection plate somebody threw in this island weird catholic church has a little stake on the island i hate something. to tell you but that island is predominantly muslim i don't want to hear about it <laughs> okay so that's that's out vatican's out. <laughs> what it out let's talk about laos let's talk uh I have no idea otherwise. Yeah, who cares? Vatican, I'm trying to think of that one so weird. that one season of Survivor. We're going to go with Vatican City. It's so weird to be on the other side of this. I think I'm right. Do you I, agree with me? I don't know if go that's ahead. right. The only the only reason I like your answer of uh, Brunei, which I'm guessing is the Sultan of Brunei, because yep. he used to have a Jaguar XJ220, which was my favorite car. <laughs> 220? Yes. Yes. So uh, we went with Brunei. The answer is a very tiny country ruled by a very rich, uh, despotic dude. It is Brunei. Mm. Yeah. What the only way in there? and out of that country is through Indonesia, I think. Basically. No yeah. Cool. Bad for us. All right. Question 10. Last question of round two. The category is television history. For 25 seasons, fans of the very worst in both comedy and demeaning Southern stereotypes were delighted on a weekly basis by the musical comedy variety show Hee Haw. Hee Haw got its start in June 1969 on CBS as a midsummer replacement for a much less stupid musical comedy variety show hosted by two brothers who saw their show canceled after a year of battling the network's censors and executives over what was considered controversial political material. What was the brothers' last name? Okay. We're in. I think the guy from the Honeymooners had one that was like Jackie Gleason. Yeah, that was like a, a flop, and then they kicked him off the air. Um, yeah, too late it, for too late for the Marx Brothers, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not. I don't think it's the Stooges. So no way um, later for that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know the story. I just don't know who it is. Okay, fair enough. We're just gonna go with Everly Brothers. Oh, mm -hmm. well, we are going with the Marx Brothers since they have some notable tunes. Well, this show was hosted by two brothers called Dick and Tommy. Uh, their last name was Smothers. It was the mm. Smothers Brothers That's Comedy right. Hour. All right. So going into the final round, it uh, looks like uh, Team T'Challa has taken the lead with 160 points, and uh, Team Killmonger is at 125. We're going to need some creative wagering to get back into this one. All right. Your categories for the final round are current events, international diplomacy, the Black Pearl, academia, and the greatest people. All of the wagers are locked in. Feel free to read the 
questions, Dave. Right on. Question one, current events. The internet was recently riveted when Americans took a short break from yelling at each other to obsessively follow the daring exploits of a scruffy raccoon that spent hours perilously climbing the facade of a 25-story building in what city? Question two, international diplomacy. Among the more ridiculous scenes from President Trump's recent Singapore fling with North Korean mass murderer Kim Jong-un was a verklempt Dennis Rodman, whom I saw in the airport a few months ago, by the way, telling CNN's Chris Cuomo that the worm himself was the only one who could bring together these two poorly tailored titans. In the interview, Rodman was wearing the finest in red MAGA hats and a t-shirt featuring the name of which cryptocurrency, which had sponsored his trip to Singapore. Question three, the Black Pearl. October 23rd is the birthday of yours truly, the aforementioned Sam Raimi, and international sportsman Edson Aranches do Nascimento, who was born on this date in 1940 and is better known by what nickname? Question four, academia. The Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society, of which I am most avowedly not a member, was founded in 1776 at which monarchical institute of higher learning, whose alumni include Thomas Jefferson, Glenn Close, Mike Tomlin, and Patton Oswalt. It's only the second oldest college in the country. Question five, the greatest people. Earlier this year, the investigative journalists at the Intercept website reported that the security budget for former EPA administrator and penny ante kleptocrat Scott Pruitt contained almost $3,000 for what very strategic items of clothing. There are two possible correct answers. You'll get full credit for either one. All right, both teams are locked in with their answers, so let's uh, let's go back down the list, Dave. All right, so question one, uh, the raccoon climbing the 25-story building, what city was that? So uh, we wager 10 on this question. Um, I told Jeff that I followed this on Twitter when it was happening. I forget the hashtag at the moment, but uh, the reason uh, I knew this answer is because someone took the rock uh, poster for Skyscraper and put the raccoon on his shoulder, um, and it, uh, I believe, is St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm. Uh, we wagered too much. Uh, wagered 30, and I thought it was right here in Chicago, so we said Chicago. The answer is St. Paul, Minnesota. Ooh, well done, Neil. Good All thing right. I spent time on Twitter for no reason. <laughs> 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 Number two, uh, the uh, T-shirt that uh, Dennis Rodman was wearing for his CNN interview was sponsored by which uh, cryptocurrency? Uh, we went zero on this one. Um, I'm pretty, I don't know if this is the right name. It was a pot company, but we we put pot coin. Yeah, we bet big on this one for 30. Um, and I was trying to remember. I remembered it was something kind of like on the fringe, like a, like a fringe product. So I was thinking, like, was it porn something? Was it, you know? And then it finally came to me that it was uh, pot. It was weed, and we kind of went through different names and ended up on pot coin. The answer is pot coin. All right. And as soon as you wrote it, I was like, I wish I wagered more. That's for marijuana, not like cookware. We were going to say reefer bucks, but then. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess you can spend it on whatever you want. 420, blaze it, smoke weed every day. (laughs) (laughs) All right, question three, the Black Pearl. Uh, So who was born on my birthday in 1940? Um, Yeah, we went with uh, five on this question. Um, We weren't really sure. We kept saying the name over and over, and and we locked in on the word sportsman, thinking it was probably like not a normal big four here in the U.S. And the only name we can come up with who had been famous enough was Pele, and we didn't know what his real name was, so we went Pele. Um, We wagered 30, um, and on my schedules, I always write um, uh, like a little note about somebody's famous birthday on a day. And I remember coming to this person in October, and I'm pretty sure this is right, so we said Pele as well. The answer is Pele. Mm -hmm. All right, question four. The Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society was founded in 1776 at which school? Uh, We wagered 15. I'll let Jeff take this one. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, Neil and I had talked about maybe um, King's College. Mm, We didn't talk about William and Mary, which I also think could be in the running for that. Um, But we figured with Monarchical, we went the Tyrant King George. We said Georgetown. Mm. We went the same way. We caught on the uh, monarchical thing and went with Princeton, and we bet 25. Well, the school is located in Williamsburg, Virginia. It was founded in 1693, making it second only to Harvard. The answer is William and Mary College. Yeah, I wondered about that. 
All right, and lastly, question five, uh, the greatest people. So Scott Pruitt uh, had $3,000 in his security budget for which strategic items of clothing? I'll take either correct answer. Uh, well, we wagered 10 on this one. Um, we seem to know a lot about Scott Pruitt, but nothing about this particular um, habit of his. Um, so we figured uh, what would be something really cautious he could uh, want to procure a lot of, uh, but 3000 would be outrageous. We said uh, a bunch of rubber gloves. Mm. And we went with hard hats. For 10. Because you always see those guys walking around in hard hats. <laughs> let me check out your facility here or your polluted river. Hold on, let me put on my hard hat. <laughs> well, the... Um... The real answer, as it sometimes is, is even dumber than any of the fake and wrong answers you guys came up with. Uh, the answer is either tactical pants or tactical polo shirts. Mm, holy crap. <laughs> so when we were joking about pants with extra pockets, we weren't that far off. Tactical pants. <laughs> All right. After the final round, it looks like even though uh, our opponents across the table, Killmonger, were given a chance to survive and rehabilitate, Nope. They chose to stab themselves, and uh, they were going to end with 120 points. And uh, today, uh, Team T'Challa, and now Triviality Champion... Re is reclaiming the crown. Reclaiming the crown. Black Panther. Of, of Black Panther, is uh, with 150 points, are Neil and Jeff as today's Cream of the Crop. You know that I'm the cream of the crop! How's that uh, purple plant juice taste? It's it's good. It's heavenly. Yeah, you know, we he, needed it. Looks bitter when he takes it, though. It always seems like it hurts a little bit. Yeah, and you guys burned all the other purple plants, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very short-sighted a Killmonger, if we're being honest. <laughs> like, yeah, he would have never gotten any benefit out of that yeah. in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything's okay. Martin Freeman survived. The land, everything will be all right. Did mm -hmm. he? Yeah, Martin Freeman survived, yeah. You sure? But we didn't. Spoiler. Just end on a somber note there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, Dave, these were amazing questions. Mm -hmm. Really well worded. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the compliment. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. Glad you could uh, take time from your trip uh, coming here. Can you uh, leave us with a, a bankruptcy term we might not have known before that we'll have to keep in our brain? Or perhaps a bankruptcy tip. Or a tip, yeah. <laughs> Avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> Pay your bills. Well, uh, even if you think that your customer is uh, on the brink of bankruptcy and therefore that any payments you receive from them might uh, one day be considered a preference payment, always take the cash. Uh, <laughs> so really just always take the cash. There you have it, guys. Always take the cash. And to his company uh, who gave him this day off and let him visit us uh, today, uh, arigato gozaimasu. There you go. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, that was a, a really fun game. Make sure you guys uh, join our group on Facebook, The Crop. Uh, check us out at uh, patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast if you'd like to support the show. We, we love all of our listeners and are continually uh, grateful for all of your help. And uh, finally, if you'd like to uh, check us out on the website or send in question five, just go to trivialitypodcast.com. Uh, for Ken, Matt, Jeff, and our guest Dave, my name is Neil, and that was Triviality. Hey, cuz, heard you're having money problems. No, you didn't. Listen, I got the answer. You declare bankruptcy, all your problems go away. Creed Bratton has never declared bankruptcy. When Creed Bratton gets in trouble, he transfers his debt to William Charles Schneider. How would that help, Creed? In Monopoly, you go bankrupt, you lose. You don't go by Monopoly, man. That game is nuts. Nobody just picks up get-out-of-jail-free cards. Those things cost thousands. That is a good point. Bankruptcy, Michael, is nature's do-over. It's a fresh start. It's a clean slate. Like the witness protection program. Exactly. Not at all. I've always wanted to be in the witness protection program. Fresh start. No debts, no baggage. I've already got my name picked out. Lord Rupert Everton. I'm a, uh, a shipping merchant who raises fancy dogs. That's the life. I declare bankruptcy!